as you can see, things look very different this week, and that's for a good reason. If you've been part of this channel for a little while, you'll know that last year in the build-up to Apple Vision Pro, I was joined by a fantastic renders artist called Marcus Kane. We worked on a number of videos together, speculating at that point what we thought was coming with what we now know as Apple Vision Pro. Marcus created quite a reputation for himself. John Prosser ended up following him on Twitter. He went on to Mac Rumors, and his renders were used on all sorts of publications all around the world, and all because we started working together on this channel. So... One week out from Apple Vision Pro actually landing, we're in as good a place as pretty much the majority of people. We haven't had our hands on it, like everybody else, but we do know all of the specs. And one thing I can tell you is that Marcus knows the business of AR, VR, spatial computing headsets. He understands the jargon. He can explain to you exactly what you can expect if you're one of those lucky people that have put down $3,500 in the US and are expecting your headset to land. So this video, hopefully will explain everything you're getting in just one week's time. Marcus really does know his stuff. We talk about everything from the weight of the device, the screens, the audio output, resolution, sensors, you name it, we talk about it. And I'm not going to break into the video at all, so I'm going to say it's a little bit earlier than normal. If you're enjoying the video this week and other videos that I put out, and I'll leave some other links to some of the videos we released last year, then subscribe. It really does help the channel out. It's the only way, in fact, for the channel to grow. And don't forget, turn on notifications as well, so that when I post a video, you are the first to know. I know it's a little bit different this week, but I thought the timing was perfect with being just one week away from a brand new dawn of a brand new category in Apple's history. We are about to go into the era of spatial computing. So subscribe if you're enjoying the video, and I'll catch up with you at the end. But enjoy Marcus and his thoughts on Apple Vision Pro. So as I just mentioned, I'm back in the saddle, as it were, with Marcus. The last time Marcus and I were together was six months ago on WWDC, the day that it was all released. And I remember your reaction. It's still up on the channel now. So, Marcus, welcome back. We've got actual facts to talk about now. Thank you for having me back, David. Yes, we, we actually have uh, pre-orders happening right now. So it's an yep. uh, interesting time for VR and spatial computing people. And the reason I thought we'd chat now is because we're kind of in as good a position as virtually everybody else insofar as, uh, no, apart from the select few, very few people have got their hands on them, you know, a tiny, tiny amount of people in the world have actually used them. So we're in as good a position as any, we've got all the details, you've got the knowledge. So if people are pre-ordering over in the States, hopefully you can give them some information of what they might be expecting to land on their doorstep on the, on the 2nd of February, isn't it? Yes, and actually, just just to kind of um, reference that point, I mean, f first of all, I think this launch is a bit strange. I mean, for me anyway, because I feel like we we didn't get we got some information, but a lot of people were like assuming there was going to be more, and then they were just mm. like, "Is pre-orders," and then off you go, you know, um, which which is which is interesting, right? But yeah, so what 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 people can be expecting? Uh, well, I don't know if you've seen this image of the box that apparently people are going to get. Today, as a recording, yeah, 3D renders come up on Mac Rumors, I think, and it's all over on Twitter as well. And it looks like a, a chuffing big box, doesn't it? It's a huge box, and I've been trying to figure out why that is. But um, yeah, from looking what what's I... inside the box, it's all on Apple's website, isn't it? So I'm just looking at their site as we're talking of what th theoretically is in the box. Yeah, I think so. In the box, you get uh, Vision Pro, but let, let's let's start with like this procedure that people have had to do um, mm -hmm. to kind of order the product, which is this very mm -hmm. kind of bespoke uh, experience, similar to um, a company called Big Screen VR, which have done a VR headset that is bespoke as well. You you scan your face with a phone app. It takes the shape of your face and then it makes uh, a, a light seal for you. And Apple are doing something very similar where. You, the first thing you did, you had to do when you were uh, pre-ordering this product, which is something new for them, is actually scan your face, um, which would then preset and pre-find the right kind of light seals and cushions for you. And that's basically the pieces that will touch your body and create the seal yep. around your face or how big the strap is at the back. And that is um, crucial so that, to the experience, isn't it? That fit is really crucial to the experience. It's, it's crucial to comfort, basically. And because people's face shape varies so much, um, it can be really hard to have like a one-size-fits-all approach for that. So that's one of the reasons they've done this. Another reason I believe that they've done it this way is that uh, they call this Apple Vision for a reason, which is basically that they see this as a vision product. It's kind of like an evolution of glasses. 
And they want to sell these in the same way that you would buy a pair of glasses, which is that nobody else wears your pair of glasses, do they? It's something that's made mm -hmm. specifically to your needs. And I think they see this as an evolution of that. And that's one of the reasons why also you have to go through this process. It's another reason why they want, like they, they say that other people can use it, but I think that they want this to be a, a per product kind of um, experience. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why you go through this um procedure basically and then once once you do that it gives you uh, your preset you actually don't even know what sizes you are as far as i could see when when i tried it and uh, maybe there's a some way you can see how big it is but it kind of does that for you and then you're able to pick your accessories and then my guess is that the, it's going to be something a bit like apple watch where they put the different pieces in in a single uh, singular box you know so when you right, get it yeah, you'll yeah. have all these separate parts um so yes I think reference to sizes, I, our friend Dan uh, Barbera from Mac Rumors, he tried ordering, just for giggles, he ordered it, his one, I think, off the phone. And then later that same day, he went onto the iPad and it gave him, oddly, two different size bands. But it seems to be the bands that they're measuring. So you, there's like a, an S setting or an R setting or there's a number that denotes mm -hmm. how big the, and the band is, presumably, again, for the for the tight fit. Um, and a couple of things just before we get into some more specs. We are going to cover all of the specs here. I know you said back at WWDC, and from what you just said, I think you, you're still of the same opinion. This is very much the first iteration of, of hopefully ending up with glasses. This is their vision project going on 5, 10, 15 years, whatever. This is just the first stage on that journey, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is this uh, the, the designer on stage uh, in that initial video said it. This is uh, basically the product that sets the principles for this category moving forward. So whereas it might not be in the form factor they want right now, all of the technology and experience they want uh, is, basically. Mm -hmm. So I, I imagine that their, their, their goal is, look, this is the minimum that we could achieve now to get the experience we want, but it will progress towards something like glasses in the future. But I honestly don't think that they are uh, anywhere near. I think we're probably looking at eight to 10 years for real glasses. Uh, which is why they've gone for this approach of uh, a VR headset with pass-through. But even that I find amazing, that within eight to ten years, all of this we're looking at now in Vision Pro could be in a pair of... I mean, that is stunningly quick, isn't that? Possible development speed is amazing. Yes, yes. It is, uh, there will have to be some advancements for that to happen because, of course, physics is still physics and it's <laughs> very hard to, to fit these things. And we're kind of like reaching this um, slowdown in, in kind of miniaturization. Uh, but it yeah. is happening, and I, I do believe that it will happen. Where, it, if it's uh, true, because the, another thing is they keep calling this spatial computing, but really it's just a VR headset. Let's be honest with ourselves. It's mm -hmm. a VR headset because it completely re uh, replaces all of the photons from real life with digital ones. That's a VR headset, right? I forgot um, the point I was going to. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. So, so uh, where. If 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 it transit, I, I wonder if it will transition from this technology to a true AR, which is where you have mm. uh, digital photons added on top of uh, real real ones, or if they will discontinue this. It will get so good that it doesn't matter if you have a screen in front of your eyes or not. You know, uh, I don't I don't um, know. Just before getting into the specs, probably the nearest that all of us have got physically is that beautiful video. It was a short video that Apple put up, just showing the making of, wasn't it? Which I'll I'll run some some B roll here on on, on our podcast now on our video now, but um, when you look at the detail of the manufacturing, it does look a thing of beauty. I mean, just from an engineering point of view alone, it looks stunning, doesn't it? I mean, yes, absolutely amazing. I, I did like a little bit of a breakdown of that as well on uh, on my Twitter because it's mm -hmm. just a, a marvel. And they maybe showed us only 10% of what kind of goes into that product as well. There was so much that was off camera there, um, but yeah, they showed us some of the main kind of uh, bread and butter of um, Apple manufacture, which is a lot to do with CNC and um, access machining uh, arms of aluminium and things like that. And, and when you, there's so many details in what they show, showed that most people wouldn't pick up, but it's just a, a testament to the iteration and the, mm. the, the, level of detail that they love detail to, to yeah. these products yeah it's just amazing you know right so now i'm going to start drawing on your knowledge and um, let's sort of begin going through it storage capacity 256 512 one terabyte now you're the you're the expert on this one on this show uh, <laughs> i'm the one going to be sort of learning along with everyone else that doesn't well certainly at 256 
potentially doesn't sound very much to me. And I think the day before release, they said it, it was implied that 256 was going to be the only storage level. Now we know you can get 512 and a terabyte. If you were buying it and you were specking it, what would you go for? I mean, so this, this I find this to be a really odd one, right? Because their position, this is a little bit different from um, the other VR headsets that are out on market. Obviously, they are positioning themselves differently, but what they're doing is mm. they position themselves as an entertainment headset. That is what this is for, mm. predominantly. Uh, you can use it to do some productivity stuff and some calls and things like that. But I honestly think that they're leaning heavily into this being like a home theater entertainment device for now uh, that may expand out. So if you're if you're going to be someone who wants to store movies and things on your headset, especially at 4K in this HDR, whatever, to go on a plane or something, then mm. you're going to want some good good storage right and then if you are adding mm. documents on there or or the fact that this takes spatial photos how big are those file sizes so to be honest i probably would would start at 512 and i'm, I'm actually very surprised that they kind of um i would call this hampering the product right from the start because nobody i mean I, I would say that the majority of people will start at that 512 gigabyte because this is already an extremely expensive product. So yeah. you're already uh, meeting with a group of people who have a bit more extra money to spend to buy something like this. So it doesn't make any sense to me that they would select something like 256 gigabytes. It, it just seems odd. You know? And then I was going through the specs and it said that it AirPlay mirrors. AirPlay mirroring is part of the the tech spec I was reading on this on the site. Now, does because well, one of the things I was a does that mean that you'll be able to share what you're watching? As I understand it now, when I AirPlay something, I can mirror from my phone to my Mac kind of thing. So, does that mm. mean that somebody else in the room would be able to experience what you're watching on a screen? What does that mean? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure which way this is. Is this inside out or outside in? In the sense mm, that it doesn't make it clear. Um, yeah, is this like I have a MacBook and then I can AirPlay what I'm doing in my MacBook onto a virtual screen and then use my yeah. MacBook in VR? Or oh, there we go. So exactly... Video yeah. mirroring. Uh, up to 720p AirPlay for mirroring your view in Apple Vision to any mm. AirPlay-enabled device, including phone, mm. iPad or Mac okay. or Apple TV. So it's, this is like a casting experience basically which which is great because it helps people to kind of see into your headset this is something mm -hmm. that quest has done for a while actually you can just have the feed on your phone and someone can see in there um and especially when uh it's very hard to direct people when they're using experience for the first time or something like that so having this really helps uh, i also imagine that for instance the apple store employees when they're taking you through the demo they will have a little screen that's linked to what you're seeing so that they can oh, talk so, you through it. Right, of course, yeah. Because, in fact, well, I'm just going to mention that now, going slightly out of step, because as we know, they're only being released uh, on the 2nd of February in, in the US only. But we, I think, are one of this second rollout phase that's coming, and hopefully by the summer. Uh, clearly, what I'm going to do is go to London and book myself a session, because they seem they know that the majority of people booking those sessions aren't going to buy them. So I'm, I'm not going to be yeah. fraudulent about it. But, uh, you know, I can't wait to actually go and see for myself just the experience that it is. I mean, you, you've you got knowledge of kind of what to expect. Are you, are you physically going to buy a pair when they come out? I am not. Um, just purely price point? Yeah, I mean, it's just not a justifiable purchase for me. I mean, I have too many VR headsets to start. <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I have four on me already. So, um, and for me, for me, I think I'm in a, a bit of a special place here because my workflow is incredibly heavy on the compute mm. side. Mm. So for me, it just doesn't make sense as a product. Um, and right, I yeah. unfortunately don't think that uh, spatial computing is going to make sense for me as a product for a long time because it will... As it gets smaller, you get less compute or like they say, you know what I mean? So it's it's going to be hard. Um, but maybe in a few durations, I will be interested. Like, for instance, Apple Watch. I love that yeah. product when it first came out. But my first mm -hmm. Apple Watch was Series 6. Um, because yeah, that's when it just got... Yeah, it just got to the yeah. point where, okay, I like the design. It's sleek. It does everything I want. Now is the time, you know? And you mentioned the rollout being odd. I, I, I agree with you. We briefly spoke over the weekend, and I sort of said it seemed a very soft release. And I, I don't know if they're just trying to ease it out into the, the niche market, because I think only sixty to 80,000 are going to be ready for the second anyway. So it's a tiny amount. And I know we know they've sold out within a few hours. So that was obvious they were going to. But I just wonder if they're trying to just let everything get out into the wild, see what mm, bugs and issues they got, and then come WWDC in June, which is only five months away, four months away, 
Vision OS 2 will come along. And I think that's potentially when they'll get more serious and hopefully see more dedicated apps, because that seems to be one of the things that's missing on release day, doesn't it? Dedicated apps. We know that Netflix, Spotify and YouTube aren't releasing dedicated apps and not even unlocking their iPad apps for it. Uh, so Which it's, it's bizarre for me because, I mean, I understand. YouTube that particularly, thing. you would have thought, you know, yeah. that's a given for it, isn't it? That is just, you can have so many more views, but I guess they just don't see it as a large, a large enough market segment to spend any money yet on it. Uh, I think it's worth it. And I know that there are some apps that are out there that are doing that, who will have like, this first mover uh, advantage mm. with that. But yes, it's, it's, it seems, it seems, odd. I mean, I, I, I don't know why they've done it this way. I have a couple of thoughts. One of them is that this is basically a dev kit, which we thought for a long time. But the problem is they haven't positioned it like a dev kit. They've positioned it like an ent- entertainment device for everyone to come get in. They have, yeah. But yeah. We, we always thought about this being basically a product to get into developers' hands so they can start to think about spatial technology. So Because this is, remember, Vision Pro. It's not Vision. Mm-hmm. So in my mind, so is the Vision end. headset going to come out? Exactly. And that this is basically a, a primer to get enough people interested and enough developers making exciting apps for when the mass market, real mass market device comes out, which is vision, you know, uh, but this is just speculation. The other thought on this could be that it's something similar to, to Apple Watch and they don't want to, um, to make the same mistake, which is that they positioned it like a fashion device to start. They went down the wrong road, didn't they? Yeah. Yes. But yeah. to be fair, it's a completely understandable um, kind of wrong insight that this is a fashion device and therefore um, it's going to overtake something like Casio or or even Rolex and then you have to position it like that. But actually what they found was this is a sensor device. It's positioned Mm. on your body, therefore it has health data and actually um, ambient health computing is the thing that this is. And Um, I actually, yes, so essentially they don't want to make the same mistake. Yeah, they, yeah, they want to exactly. wait to find out what happens. With Le- it. Learn from history. And we were just talking yeah. about apps there. I, as you know, I, I write regularly. And I wrote yesterday that the timing of this with the apps and developers being a little bit reticent on bringing apps out at the moment couldn't come at worst time with this new 27% rule, which I knew, I'm sure you know about the Apple tax rule. In the States now, people can go and buy their apps from third party. You can go, they put it on there. You can go to the website and buy it. And it will only be a 27% tax, but Apple is saying it's your responsibility, it's down to you. And of course, the developers are feeling a little bit alienated at this at the moment because they're being pushed to one side. <laughs> what Apple really needs at the moment is to have as many developers on side at the moment because they were queuing up for, for iPhone and iPad. They were queuing around the blocks, I think, because they knew that the volumes of both of those products were going to be enormous. So their investments in developing apps would see quite a quick return. With Vision Pro, I'll use the term, and I'll, I'll probably use it many times again through, is it, it's a niche product. It clearly is at the price point and the amount of units available. It isn't for everybody. So maybe developers are holding off for that as well. Mm-hmm. And it, it, re- it really wouldn't surprise me if they, they do do that. I think that the VR market is incredibly hard, and having Apple come in is a huge help to everybody mm-hmm. to help legitimize this. But I still mm-hmm. think that Apple will run into the same problems that most of the VR companies do, which is retention. It's, uh, do you have a reason to put that headset on every day, you know? Um, and, and that was a question I was just going to ask you. You said you've got four pairs. Do you use them daily? I, I do use my uh, VR daily. I use it for a mix of uh, productivity and gaming um, right. because I have a 3D application that I used to do modeling and things mm-hmm. like that, which is a game changer. Uh, but also, um, I've been completely spoiled in 2D games. <laughs> I don't turn on the PlayStation or computer games anymore. I, like, even if it's simple, uh, that kind of like full 3D games, a great experience. So I, I do use it daily. Yeah. Now, what about the chip? It's come out with the M2. And this is their premium product. It's a brand new device, a whole new category. We're running M3 on Max, and they've come out with M2. Surprise to you or not? It did surprise me, yeah. I, I honestly thought that that was a bit of a... A cloak and dagger moment where they had actually put an M3 device, but the M3 was not announced yet. And so that they were mm. saying it was M2 when it was actually M3. And then like upon release, people were going to find out it was M3 and be like, wow, look at this uh, jump in graphics because M3 has more graphics processing and things like yeah, this. Yeah. What I do understand though, is that this is a um, uh, uh, an adapted version of the chip that does have more graphics cores, I believe has 10... GPU cores think, and 16 I don't think it was a data on here. Um, 
chips. It's eight, eight so the M2 chip in here has got an eight core CPU with four performance cores and four efficiency cores, 10 core GPU and 16 core neural engine with 16 gigs of RAM. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, only, only 16 gigs of RAM. That's. I mean, it's uh, so again, this is like um, what you call it use case, like. Uh, Specific, I mean, like everything's tailored. All of the all of the hardware is tailored for the, the minimal experiences that you'll be having. But yeah, I mean, they could have beefed this thing up. But I, what mm. I think is that the whole process is costing them a fortune to get these mm. things made. So they're mm. trying to be as minimal as they can with the spec as possible. But again, this is like it's also interesting that this is not something that you could have upgraded. You can only upgrade the um, uh, storage, but you can't change, upgrade the graphics. But it kind of makes sense because all of the hardware is Can you upgrade after purchase then? You can upgrade the what, storage the after graphics? purchase, can you? Yeah. Uh, I don't so, then... from what I understand, because also, for instance, uh, let's just go back to that point about the, um, the light seal being different for mm. the, uh, the guy from Mac Ruins. There, apparently, Mark Gurman said today that if you do find, have one that doesn't fit you, you've got two weeks to go back um and and swap it. i think it's two weeks maybe it's more i'm not sure yeah. but you can go and swap it and I, I don't know if that's also storage but maybe maybe you can upgrade it after the fact you know because of course with m, m series you know it's point of purchase isn't it when you buy you buy that's all you've got that's all you can take so i guess that's one of those things as with everything future proof if you think you're going to need at least five to it's probably worth going for the terror i know it's all stacking up but you know it's expensive anyway <laughs> if you're yeah, going to drop this sort of you're money gonna pay, <laughs> you're going to pay three thousand six hundred you might as well pay three thousand nine hundred ah but this other things that we have not talked about but before we get into mm. that it's it's mm. a it, it's a beefy amount of processing because it doesn't just have the m2 but it also has the reality chip which i the think R1, is yeah. something like there Maybe it's an M1 dressed up. Maybe it's uh, yep. one of the A series chips, neural cores. I don't know, but they're using that to uh, dedicate for the sensors and the. And just the to explain away that you're you're great explaining away their terminology. So the R1's got a 12 millisecond photon to photon latency. Does that mean there's virtually no delay in English? It's it's a very short amount of time. Um, I think the. I think the delay there's like an exp there's like a figure which is like twenty milliseconds I think it is where like that's that's the level if you get it below twenty milliseconds that's when it feels magic and instant um, so that's what they're going for there Apple have like this tendency to so for instance when they were developing Safari they mm. had this one metric which was I, I, I think it was speed like how fast the web page loaded and that was their gold standard. Any code that they submitted or anything like that, if it did not make it faster or it kept it the same, it was it was okay. But if it made it slower, it was a no go. So I think right. that this twelve millisecond photon to photon latency is kind of like their benchmark they're using to make themselves yep. better. So if anything that they do to the device makes that slower, it's a no go, you know. And then it then it has to get lower. But for twelve milliseconds, I think that's a very good. Um, starting time and you you won't really catch any lag in the uh, so, the visuals maybe your hands so it's almost like that, too but. too quick for the brain to detect any delay kind of so is there as a, as a delta figure say i mean i know you know i'll keep coming back i'm i don't know anything about vr headsets really is there a delta comparison there between say oculus and this Do, have they got a, a latency figure that they promote uh, on their I, would, I, would, I would have to look that up i'm not uh, i'm not 100 percent sure basically what the what the milliseconds latency is between cameras and the screen maybe i can just double check here um while you're looking that up i will just fire something into your into your ears so when you were last on with me obviously then they launched it at wwdc but we didn't really have any spec we saw it for the first time something we talked a lot about was sensors and there seems to be a load of sensors in here, a whole heap of them. Is this kind of a, a new way of going about, well, spatial computing, VR headsets? I mean, it just looks, we've got, so look, listing it out here, we've got two high resolution main cameras, six world facing tracking cameras, four eye tracking cameras, which I assume is so that you can look at the apps you want to open and so on, a true depth camera, a LiDAR scanner, uh, four inertial measurement units, a flicker sensor and an ambient light sensor. I mean, that sounds like there's a lot going on on your face. There is. And actually, if you remember, there was meant to be a lot more. 
uh, in there, basically. Um, but basically, this again comes back to this. By, uh, by the way, just to quickly reference, so I'm looking at the mm. Quest 2, which is the older mm. one. Apparently, it's about 47 mm. millisecond. And maybe with and Quest 3, you've got it down to 12. 30 millisecond. So 12 milliseconds is 12. very good. But really good. you have to remember that is what they call photon to photon. So that's, that's right. the yep. photon comes into the camera, gets processed, jiggled, whatever happens to it, and then gets uh, put out on the screen. That's mm. uh, not necessarily, I don't know if that counts for the digital content that, that is then put over the top, you know? Right. Um, okay. But I, I assume that you can think of that as 12 milliseconds. Back to so the let's, sensors. Let's, yeah, so let's talk them through then. The two high-resolution main cameras sensors, they are doing what? So they're the ones that are going to be capturing the environment to then display to your eye. So my guess is that they're over 4K each. They're probably something right. like the Sony sensors, and uh, maybe something similar mm -hmm. to what they're using in the iPhone. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure which sensors they use, and we'll have to wait for a breakdown there. But they're the ones that are placed right about here, and they're the ones that see the world, and then it's recalculated. It's called reprojection because... Uh, the cameras aren't where your eyes are, so we have to use some clever neural net stuff to basically reposition virtually the cameras where your eyes would be. Um, so that's what they're for, and they're, they're essential basically to the mixed reality experience that Apple is offering. Something that we're seeing on here is actually this is a HDR, I believe, and that the, the screens that, are, um, uh, that you're going to be looking at do show HDR. I don't know what the level of that is, but apparently it does and drastically make the experience better as opposed to even just two 4K screens. It makes it feel more real. Mm -hmm. And then we have six world-facing tracking cameras. Exactly. So this is what this is what we call SLAM, simultaneous location and movement. Right? See, that's like why it, I love you. Who else would know that? Who else would know that? <laughs> <laughs> basically, it's 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 like um, it's it's what maps your world. It's what will find what we call anchor points, which are uh, spatial points that don't move that allow the headset to differentiate itself from like if it's here to here it knows where it's moved because of these anchors and it does that through um, a range of ways but these six world tracking cameras you've got some that uh, point down to your face here uh, yes yeah so these are right. these are also your face so you've got two underneath they go to your face You've got some that look out to the world, and you've got some that look forward. Um, I don't think we have one that looks up like we originally thought it was going to be, but basically they map your environment, and I believe that some of them are infrared, and what happens is there are dot projectors that fire dots over everything, similar to how Face ID works, and that yep. helps them to basically pick out your environment. And this is essential for, for instance, the room mapping that the headset automatically does. So it says... You've got a desk here, you've got a wall there, you've got a window here, and they're needed for that. And then you've got so, two. Yeah, go on. Yeah, so no, I hadn't, just as you mentioned that, I hadn't thought of that. So in that lovely video, the explainer video that they put up, which is really well done, I thought. It was as real as they could make it. So they, he's, they're sitting in his living room. If I was to have bought and calibrated my Vision Pro at home, then I come in here to the studio. Obviously, the calibration wouldn't be changing, but the headset itself would see it's in a different environment. It would know where I've got the windows, where I've got the desk, what it needs to bounce audio from. It would work what, it out what itself. What do you mean by um, calibration? Well, I, I understood that when you put the headset on for the first time, it has with the eye tracking we're coming to, I believe there's a series of dots that you have to follow, almost like you know magic spots. So your eyes mm -hmm. are tracking, so it could work out the speed that your eyes are seeing, I think. So... That you won't need to do that is... ever again, basically. Right. So you, you, might, you might have to do that. Yeah. You might have to do that like once a year, but the eye tracking yeah. thing will be done. But the whole mm -hmm. environment tracking thing just happens like automatically. Right. Okay. So basically you can walk into a room and the headset will already be able to spatially know where it is, for instance, and you can right. move through that space. Um, but for instance, I, I don't know if there's like, if you want to map the room accurately, you might have to go through a process to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Or maybe it just does it automatically. I know that there's like a companion phone app that you can, uh, I think sadly Bradley showed that, where you could see the room being being built in there. But like Apple does with everything, this will be kind of like a very hands-off, magical, does it by itself. It, it will just experience. work, yeah. yeah. So then we've got the eye tracking cameras, haven't we? Four eye tracking cameras. Yeah, and something they did really clever was to put these underneath the lenses. So the pancake lenses at the back there, they've actually put it underneath and to the side. Um, mm -hmm. And that looks through the lens, and then it, will, it basically what, 
well, I think it does it a number of ways, but I remember the patents looked at reflections on your eyes, which is madness. And mm-hmm. um, there's also infrared LEDs. Just, so I'm just letting that sink in a minute. It's, it's looking at reflections on your eyes. Yes, yeah. yeah. Wow. A, it, so it has, it has IR LEDs around the lenses, so it illuminates yeah. your eyes, but you can't see yeah. that light because it's infrared. The cameras pick up on that, and they look for like the ovals that are produced in the reflection. And they use that to te- uh, to check the curvature. It's it, it's it's bonkers, bonkers stuff. You think about that. This is why this product took over ten years of development, and mm. why other people mm. take so long because there's just so many siloed parts of an, um, advancement that you need to make a product like this work on this magical mm. kind of like experience. Even if this headset does not meet expectations, it is a, a technological marvel. Uh, that is absolutely sure. Oh. Absolutely. I mean, I'll be as, as, you know, come the second, I'll be wanting to see as many videos about it. And I'm not the market. I, I mean, I love tech clearly, but it's because it's the start of something. We know there have been other headsets, but this technology, this refined, this quick is something brand new to us all, right? I, I think the way I would think about it, which Apple does very well, is they've created this packaged experience. Uh, I think that everything that Apple has done, for the most part, you can grab from different places but there's nothing that's in this holistic experience yet uh, a lot you know so and and that in itself is something new and that uh, your everyday consumer can align themselves with mm. Um, mm. kind of like advanced movers or like early adopters like myself we're happy to do the work that is required to capture all the things we need to have to have this experience but your average person just wants it done for them so this is a great way to to get into that you know so back to the cameras then. Then after the eye track cameras, we've got true depth and a LIDAR. Maybe you can sort of group those together. Yeah. So I need, I need to fully... Uh, true depth and LIDAR, they work in similar ways from what I understand. LIDAR is That's, a laser. Yeah. It's that produces uh, dots. And it, uh, basically, that's it's like super tracking. I think they use this both for what's in front of you and for... Um, more uh, hand sensing and so and the true depth works in a similar way i believe it has mm. like two cameras that are look at the same object and then they can uh, sense depth and all of that is basically to have accurate tracking in front of you of your hands because that's really important but also course, yeah. occlusion uh, occlusion of objects so if i have this cup here and a virtual mm. object behind it i need to know mm. where the edges i need to mask out that cup so that mm. when my hand goes, you know what I mean? And that's yeah, yeah, a very yeah, hard yeah, yeah, thing yeah, yeah. to do. Yeah. And you need as much data as possible. So these really help with that. Um, and then the inertial measurement means that I am used. This is things yep. like gyroscopes and altometers. They're basically uh, a mini sensors on the device that help it know its orientation without the cameras. So my guess is they pair the data from that with the data from the cameras to be able to get really precise kind of positioning and movement um, out of the headset. So when they showed in that video the audio, uh, presumably that was coming out of speakers that were uh, were just behind the the skull and just above the ear, which are spatial. And we know you can use AirPods Pro with with Vision Pro as well to get an even better experience. But presumably with the audio coming out of there, everyone in the room is going to be hearing that audio as well. Correct? Has to be, right? They're, they're speakers. So yes and no. Uh, from what I understand, it's a bit of a directional speaker. So if you've right. ever used a Quest, uh, I have one here, but they, they use something similar, but the speakers are on the inside. Um, mm-hmm. And there is kind of like a pocket of audio here. And um, mm. so I, I reckon you will be able to hear it, especially when it's on its louder settings. Um, mm. But it will be, it will feel like hearing these headphones, for instance, um, uh, from afar. But it is, it is a problem. But oh, so just a little bit of bleed, basically, or just hear a bit of audio bleed if you were in the I room with somebody so. else using uh, one. Yeah, yeah. We, we we need we need to find out basically when when we see this. But that's why what? they released the Gen Two AirPods Pro Two to go with this headset. So that. Right, yeah. Someone, yeah, someone who buys his headset probably already has them. So, so I was going to two more questions. I've got a whole list of things I want to run through with you. We're going to try and keep it as snappy as possible to give people as much information as possible. But battery life and battery packs. Now we know that Belkin, I think, have already been commissioned to bring out some sort of battery Clip. charge or cold or something, haven't they? It doesn't come it's included because it's about clip, yeah. Belt clip, right? Yeah, because I was just looking what was in the box because there's no mention. It's just the battery, isn't it? 
Yep. So battery life, they're giving it to two, two and a half hours, weren't they, for memory? Yeah. To, or, as they say, uh, all the perpetual battery life if you plug in. It's like, well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. plug anything in, we've got perpetual battery life. So uh, reading the actual specs, they're saying up to two hours of general use, video watching up to two and a half hours. An Apple Vision Pro can be used while charging the battery, which is something we did talk about. No, we were talking about interchanging batteries, weren't we, when we were speculating last summer that maybe it would have a backup battery in there, but they're saying that it can be used while charging the battery. Yes, I mean, again, this is another thing that they have not really talked about. It doesn't seem like they want you to do hot swapping because uh, there is no internal battery, right? So if you, as soon yep. as you unplug this thing, you, which is no good, and you then you blind it and you can't see. Uh, this is another one of the safety features. I'm just like, what is going on here? Also, this puck locks into place. You know, there is no safety pull, which is madness. But mm. the fact that they're selling these extra batteries on the web means that they know people are going to be swapping them out or at least yep. maybe it breaks or I don't know, yep. but they, they're selling it for $199. Um, and, but they're very the, specifically the, not talking about hot swapping. So the extra packs are 199 are they? I didn't see that. So extra battery packs are 199 Yes. 199 uh, The lens inserts from, uh, Zeiss are also $199. So if you have a problem with your eyes, this product's going to cost you more, which is yep. ridiculous when it's a product for your vision, but okay. Um, and they're also selling a travel case. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, I heard about it. I think I didn't see. Is that part of the Apple release? It's it's on the extra. Oh, it's another extra, page. is it? Right. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's $199. And actually, there's something that I noticed on there. This is a little... Side note that I didn't notice before is that they're, they're quite clearly going for a space theme. I never thought about that before, but it makes total sense. The bag looks like uh, kind of like the astronaut ruffle material that they use on the spacewalk suits, you know? Yeah. And, and that yep. makes sense because this is like a visor that looks like an astronaut helmet. And they mm. even released that really cool video, which was about like all the different uh, forms of like science fiction and stuff where we have people putting on masks or whatever to kind of break down this um, stigma around putting something on your face, which they already did with, uh, we, which we've already done with headphones. But yeah, just I just thought it was a nice little touch that they had that material on there, uh, with the link to kind of space. Now, as you know, I'm kind of mentally limited on some things, and this is one of them. I've been bouncing this around in my head, and I don't know the answer. If you and I were sitting physically here in my studio, both three and a half thousand pounds worse off, or dollars worse off, both wearing Vision Pro. When I look at you, what do I do? I see you with goggles. Yes. Do I? So you, if I was in a room looking, forget. I'll come back to the goggle bit in a minute. So if I'm in a room with somebody with the with the password, well, the password is for them to see me. But if I look at somebody in a room with eyesight, I'm seeing them totally normal as I would expect to see you standing in the room now. Is that right? There's no difference. Uh, what, when you've got the headset on? Yeah. I mean, there will be a difference um, because this is this is 4K per eye, but this is still like a quarter uh, of what uh, information your eyes are used to seeing. So it's going to be like the qu effectively a quarter of the resolution of light. So right. you can tell okay. you're wearing a headset. And also it doesn't have anywhere near the HDR that to your eyes do the, the contrast we see is insane mm -hmm. so you will notice that it will seem pixely but what i assume you will see is them wearing the goggles and then you might be able to see their own um uh real well, i forgot what they call it now but the past eyesight isn't it past, eyesight that's it yes yeah. uh, you might be able to see that because i don't know for instance how the contrast will work for that in the headset but as far as I understand, they're not going to do a digital overlay because you will have right. to scan your face to make eyesight right with the headset itself, which we predicted, by the way, that you would have to do. Can you remember yep. we said you yep. have to use the headset to do it? Um, they could, for instance, put that digital model over your real face so that they could hide this visor. But I think that um, the quality is just not there yet, and it will dip into something what we call the uncanny valley which is where your brain doesn't like it. It's like, this is freaking me out. And so I think they just decided, let's just not do that. Yeah. So the, the kind of best use cases for this when it first comes out, with the limited amount of apps being out there, we've got two, and, and very little in the way of gaming either, which presumably will come later. 
So we're talking really about either purely content, which we know you're going to have to generally consume through the web because there's so few apps or Apple TV, clearly. Um, and then they did show productivity. They showed sitting with a MacBook, the screen suddenly appears in front. Now, that to me did look amazing. You know, if I'm sitting, say, all editing this podcast and I can suddenly sit and do it on a screen in front of me that, that's huge, it looks amazing. It, uh, is that something, which way do you think people, when they buy this, will end up using it? Or will it just be a rich man's expensive toy initially, just a little bit of eye candy? I don't, I don't know where it's going to sit, you know? I I do think it's going to be rich man's eye candy toy to start with. But right. uh, actually, it's, it's really good that you brought that up because I think a lot of people have bought this product thinking it's going to become a great productivity tool. So we mm. talked about this one really easy win with a productivity tool is just to nail the virtual screen experience. So say I've got my MacBook here and I'm using mm -hmm. my MacBook. First thing is when I look at my MacBook, I want to be able to see my screen properly. I don't care if you put over like a mirror of my display virtually. I don't mind that. Uh, but what I want to be able to do is to grab a screen and put it to the left, grab a screen, put it to the right. I want my video timeline here in front of me. I want to be able to move mm. things about on that timeline. Grab that's what people were hoping this would do. And even the videos that Apple released showed this, but what we're actually seeing on Twitter uh, today is people realizing that it only mirrors one MacBook display and that the, all the other displays have to be iPad apps that will run natively on the headset. So and in other words, me, you could have Apple Music running to one side, but you're still only going to get one MacBook display. And it's a mirrored display, so it's not even an extra display. It's not like you can yeah. be working on your main <laughs> thing and have a movie here. You know, you can't yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, you yeah, could, yeah. but it would have to be in the iOS app of this. But mm. So that's a big, a big loss already for me. Like if this is about maximizing virtual screens or stuff, people want to use their laptops. They can't do that. Mm, so mm. you will have to work within for the majority within the the spatial headsets experience and the apps that allow it to do that, which could limit you. So it might be limited to things like Word and Microsoft and some Figma or some simple apps, but nothing too heavy on the processing. And if you want to do that, you'll have to use your one mirrored screen on your laptop, which maybe they think is enough, right? But yeah, therefore, the majority of what this will be used for is like a home center experience, basically. And the, the, I think the other thing to try and something else, I've given it a lot of thought before talking to you. And it's, we said this is a whole new category. It's a whole new language in gestures we've got to learn, isn't it? You know, we were watching that demo with it all being pinched. And, but we're so used to using a mouse or magic trackpad or whatever. You know, if you're in the Mac world, you kind of get used to all the gestures and so on. But this, again, is training the brain to work in a very different way. If they want us to be intuitive with, I'm sitting there looking as if I've got one in front of me. You know what I mean? It's, 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 because the video is that good in, in showing us what's going on. It's going to be a whole new language we've got to learn to work with it, right? Mm -hmm. If they wanted to use it for, you know, hours during the day for part of our work day, which is presumably where they'd like it to begin going toward at some point. Mm -hmm. I think it is something you're going to have to learn, but I think that they've done this in the smartest way possible. Uh, and the reason I would think about this is like, what do you do when you want to click something? You look at it, right? So say mm -hmm. I want to click the X in the top right. The first thing I do is I look at the X and then I drag my hand over to the X and then I do the click. What mm. this effectively does is it removes that middle section. I look at it. Instead of dragging my hand over, I just go straight to the click. Right. So it's it's basically already an experience that we know and do. We're just removing a step, which will take people a little bit to get used to, but the brain loves um, optimization. So it will, it will mm. grasp onto this very fast. And I, I actually think that this is one of the key things that was kind of like missing from uh, a lot of the experiences we were seeing. This kind of like, uh, let's call it click at a distance, you know, you have to look at something and grab it. But for me, the next thing is manipulation of that. Like I, I want minority report. I look at it, I click it, but then I want to, I want to do stuff with that screen. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to have to look at the bottom right hand corner and drag it out and then look at this and then that's going to get fatigue. What I really want is like interpretation of my movement into action, which may come later with AI or anything. But anyway, 
<laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. This is still impressive, yeah. For absolutely, yeah. The There's one area. Everybody I've heard, that's, you know, the few people that have used it, a few creators that I've watched videos on, they've said the eye tracking apparently is just crazy good. It's so accurate and fast. It just knows exactly the app you're looking at, and it's just open. I mean, apparently, yeah. it's it's just there's no latency. It's just done which yeah. again it's crazy to think that um so i mean it sounds like you know there's the, obviously the one thing we haven't talked about which has been over twitter is the weight issue now a few people have used it uh marquez put up a tweet saying it's heavy it's heavy it's really heavy <laughs> um is the weight going to be because it's it's i'm trying to th- what was so, the sort of weight up there it's two, uh, six it's 650 grams which is considerable so i think <laughs> Yeah, because I think the AirPods Max you've got on there, I think, are about 300 grams. So it's at least double that. And these things feel heavy. They are heavy. They (laughs) They are seriously heavy. For me, I always worry they're going to come off my head. Uh, Yes. I I can't use them when I play VR because they they really do fly off, and I'm very worried about that. Um, This, for me, was one of the, the kind of, it's one of the strangest design choices on the headset. Um, Paul Malucky, who's the guy who started uh, Oculus um, and kicked off this whole race for us, um, mm. he is a hardware genius. And actually, the very first consumer headset they released called CV1 on the Oculus is still one of the most comfortable today. But he put comfort for headsets uh, really succinctly, which is that what really matters is the torque force. So that's like how, how much like a torque is a twist force. Mm-hmm, so it's mm-hmm. like how much does something when you hate twist on your face? That's where the mm-hmm. weight comes from, which is why some companies put a processing on the back and the thing on the front to counterbalance that torque mm-hmm. that you feel, right? But, which we talked about last year, yeah. Yes, but the problem is that Apple have what we call a hard part here leading mm-hmm. to hard silicon here that then go to a soft part in the back. Um, and if you don't have that hard part going all the way around the back, then you've got no way to apply the torque force to there, if that makes sense. Because this part of the back is soft, so it wants to move around. So basically, all of the weight is going to be was, on here. I was just going to say, which, gravity means that, forget the, the, the forehead, it's all going to be resting on sort of the cheekbones here, isn't it? It's all going to be yes. resting, yeah. There. And even with the top strap, because it doesn't mm. have this counterbalance weight at the back, or mm. a hard component to maybe hook into the back of here, then if you mm. think about it, what you've got, you've got like a lever like this. So you've got something mm. that's pulling here, but it's still going to pull into your face because there's yeah, nothing yeah. going this way. So essentially, all the weight is going to be here and here. Um, and they tried to address this, by the way, with a new strap. So when they first released it, people instantly... It was just a solo system. strap, wasn't it? Yes, this is not going to be. So I don't know if this is a strap that was intended for the cheaper version of Vision and they decided to put it on this or mm. that they actually had so much time from announcement to launch that they actually made the product better with this new strap which i find is really funny right they go from this beautiful incredibly complex 3d knit uh solo strap which is something like a, looks a marvel and then you realize <laughs> yeah. like oh let's just go back to velcro straps and it works you know what i mean so the eyesight we we touched on briefly and i know we spoke about it a lot last year and probably it's the last main topic we really need to cover because i think that's going to be the one that gets a lot of uh, attention because i guess it's so easy to show videos and pictures of the eyesight it, so it, that is uh, and yet we don't see, we have not seen any no no way. because even when they had the they had another session of uh, viewing sessions last week didn't they, in, in la and in new york and yes, there were controlled pictures, which Apple took and released, but it was still without the eyesight on. So mm-hmm. I think there, there's going to be a, I mean, that's going to be, we all know that the haters on this are going to take pictures of that and just going to be ripping the mick out. We know that it's going to happen. Have you, what's your best guess of how good it will look? I mean, the, the image that they put at the top of their page, I think, gives us an idea of that model with eyesight, doesn't it? But we haven't actually physically seen what it looks like yet. Yeah, I, th- I think... I don't know, really. It's very hard to tell because I think one of the key things about this is that it's a screen with a lenticular uh, lens over the top of it, which Mm. basically turns it into this 3D image that Mm. is going to look different from the different angles you look like. And I I really think it's going to have to be something that you see in person to fully fully understand, you know? But Mm. I would think of it like a pair of dark ski goggles or dark glasses. You're kind of going to see the eyes underneath, but not as clear as you would uh normally 
it's it's I think it removes some of the brightness as well, and, and then it has to go through this lens. Um, and I don't know, for instance, if it's going to be visible outside on a bright day. This display would have to be very bright, and that's more power usage that they don't really more want battery. to give. Yeah, you know, it's already yeah. a chug on processing and battery. So, you know, they want to limit. But so, I do believe they think this is absolutely essential to the product. Um, so, kind of the, the takeaway then: this isn't actually a particularly mobile device as such. You wouldn't want to take it to the park and sit there necessarily watching a movie. It's much more, it's going to be better tailored to a home environment, I take it. Yeah, I, I, like basically indoor spaces, I think. This is going mm, to be mm. at your desk, on your sofa, uh, or as they've shown on an aeroplane. I think that they've built the device that you could walk around with it on, which people are definitely going to do, and therefore they had to make it as safe as they could. Mm-hmm. But mm. there are many things that are going to make this uh, a better home experience to start than an outside experience. But something like this um, uh, eyesight display is a marker that they do intend for it to be something that is used all the time and outside later, you know? And, and you do think that it, this is the, the, we've kind of alluded to it, this is a pro version. There will then be Apple Vision and eventually Apple Glass, or whatever it's going to be called. So this is kind of the long-term vision, that, long-term plan they have for it. Yeah, I, 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 I think so. I mean, why would you release something called Vision Pro if yeah. it wasn't going to be a vision? I mean, it's like within their whole product line. I thought that that was them saying this. Um, what we're releasing now is a very high end product because it's the best we can basically in order to make the experience we intend. It has to go full throttle to the wall. Therefore, we name this a pro product so people understand that. Yep. Uh, it's a lot of money, but yes, I think that they will release a cheaper version, but I don't think that they're going to skimp on uh, the features of the device. I think that them saying that this is how this is the um, principles of the product means that it, the experience will be the same, just for instance, the volume. Maybe they'll use last year's processes like they do for iPhones yeah. now. Yeah, exactly. Or last yeah, year's yeah. sensors, you know, or last yeah, year's yeah, displays. Yeah. That's how they'll bring down the price and maybe they'll maximize the manufacture and things like this. Yeah. And, and just one last point to, before we wrap up. Uh, we didn't talk on, on the display side of it. 23 million pixels sounds like it's ridiculously pixel dense. Uh, so I, I actually think that this point is a bit counterintuitive to what you think because while you do have 23 million pixels and you have these screens right close to your eye, actually, uh, your brain is probably thinking, where did all the information go? (laughs) And actually, it's the (laughs) other way. If the the experience is too far from reality, too far from what your internal body senses, like your spatial senses are telling you, that's when you get sick. This is also what we call VR sickness, when uh, the experience of VR is too different from, that's what makes you sick. So actually... Uh, the more lifelike, the more pixels, mm-hmm. the better the HDR, the less sick, the less headset, uh, headaches that you will get uh, in the device. Um, but for instance, this is missing something like a, um, uh, I forgot what you call it now, convergence uh, problem. So like, for instance, there is no depth planes. There's this one set depth plane, which is what we see on many of the devices. But um, that is an advancement that they need to make to help sickness and things like that. So there may be some people who get sick wearing this headset for sure. But my guess mm-hmm. is it will be in the experiences that are uh, far from the ones that Apple intend. So if you're just using it at your desk as a virtual display, I doubt anybody's going to get sick from this, basically. So looking at it as a product now, because we've talked about it, pulled it apart. I think spoke about everything. Are you happy with what they delivered? Do you think this is about as uh, as from a point of view where the technology could be in an area that you're passionate about? Is this as good as it could get right now? Uh, that's a hard question, <laughs> David. I can be harsh or not. I mean, isn't it as as some someone a major enthusiast in this market? Personally, I think that there's elements that I would have liked to see pushed a little bit more. Uh, Mm -hmm. in terms of offering, even in terms of software experience. Like if you're going to make this a um, uh, productivity, make it a productivity tool, like really go for it. Like do the things that we actually want, you know. That's where it lets down for me. But as a piece of hardware, it's 
it's a marvel, you know. But I, but mm. also when I look at other competitors, what they've done, I also think that they don't get enough credit. Like the Quest Three is a fraction of the price, but it delivers. It also delivers mirroring of a display. Mm. It doesn't have four K mm. per eye screens, but it's it's very good. And you've got Magic Leap too, which is doing like real AR and slam and mm. all this occlusion, everything like this already on the device. So I think it, it does set a new bar for all in one, but it's not quite as far for the price as what I had assumed. But still, right. it's 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 a marvel of uh, manufacture, basically. Well, hopefully, if you're one of the lucky folks out there that are buying on the second, um, this will be out a good week beforehand. So I think Marcus has hopefully kind of described to you what you're getting for your your buck, your three and a half thousand bucks, and you know, hopefully, it'll deliver on the things that you want it to go. We've we pulled it all apart. We've looked at everything. So we've gone through pretty much what the product is, why the all these different parts are on there. I guess now it's just going to be getting it into the hands of the users and waiting to get some feedback. Been doing that, yeah. The be- the best way I can put this forward like for, for if you buy if you see something that they are showing as a feature of the headset be it the movies be it the the mirroring the spatial mm. apps or whatever if that's something that speaks to you and you think i can really get something out of that then this is going to be an amazing product for you like it's it's going to be incredible to if you've never mm. experienced vr before or even mixed reality it's going to blow your mind and there is this magical thing that happens when you first try something like this where your brain's like oh i love this this is great yeah. stuff you know but if you're someone who's looking at this and and is trying to figure out how they're going to use it then i don't think it's for you yet you know you re- you, re- you really want i would not advise you to drop four thousand dollars on this <laughs> <laughs> Plus the four hundred ninety nine for Apple Care, which is exactly absurd. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, uh, well, I, I, think, I, I yeah. can't wait for them to get to London. I'm definitely, definitely, definitely going to head to Battersea, book myself a session, and just go and see it. So I've got first hand experience. I can actually talk and write about it. I know the horse will have bolted by then, and many people have had it by the time we get it. But again, it's not like I'm far behind anyone in the UK because none of us have got it yet. I still don't know how. There's a few creators in the UK that have ordered them from the US, but I don't know how that's working because you yeah, need a US prescription, thing. don't you? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe somebody's just like, oh, you've got a face who's similar to mine, and they're yeah. going to order it in, maybe travel to the US, do their exchange of parts, and then come back. Um, but also, you have to be so careful. Like, what if Apple software locks this to a location? Um, mm, because, exactly for instance, uh, I live in Portugal. There, we They don't sell the Meta um, glasses here because it's illegal to record people in public. So. Right. You, you could not sell this device here. And actually, if you mm. were to bring it over here, you could get in serious trouble. Uh, mm. And Apple too. Mm. So I don't know how they're going to do that. There's going to be some good stories coming out, right? Five, <laughs> me and you will be able to try it. Tell, <laughs> let, me, let me know when you go going to Battersea and I'll book a flight and uh, I'll come yes, try it. Yes, we should maybe. absolutely do that. We should absolutely do that. We should, we should. Um, where can people find you on Twitter, by the way, Marcus? Because I know you're on there a lot. You've got a good following. I'm just Marcus C. Kane on Twitter basically. And I recently did a post that um, broke down what I thought was happening inside of the the uh, manufacturer video there. And I post bits and bobs about spatial computing and things I'm interested in. So uh, come chat Wonderful. with me. Wonderful. Well, thank you for finding time and kind of explaining this mythical beast to us. We've got more of an idea of what's going on there. So I think you've actually made it understandable in plain man's language. So Marcus, thank you so much. No worries. Thank you very much for having me, David. And we'll catch up again soon, maybe in Battersea. That would be nice, right? We can do a little video from there. <laughs> Let's do it. Cheers, Marcus.